Um, good afternoon. Welcome, everybody. Um, I am Alex Schaffner. I'm the events director. And just so you know, guys, everybody can hear everything. Um, I am so happy to welcome you to this afternoon's event with one second. We have so many mics on. Ah, there we go. Sorry about that. So I'm happy to invite you into this event tonight with Phil Donahue and Marlo Thomas, who are going to be interviewed by Jan, uh, Jane and Paul Ayu. And they will be discussing Phil and Marla's book, which is called What Makes a Marriage Last. I know most, if not all of you, already have a copy. I hope you're enjoying it. And if you don't have it yet, um, I hope you have a wonderful time reading it. It's just a really great book. Um, just in case you haven't heard of us before, Brookline Booksmith is an independent bookstore that's been around since the early 1960s. Um, we're very happy to still be surviving in this exciting time. And we really appreciate uh, your attendance and your support um, your book purchases and generally choosing to be a part of our community today. Um, if you've never been on a Crowdcast event before, I see a couple people have noticed it already, but the chat is open the entire time. Um, you can hang out with everyone there. If you have a question for the authors, uh, there is a button that says ask a question at the bottom of the screen. You can type in what you want. If you want to peruse the questions that are already there, anyone is welcome to do that. Um, and if you click the vote button, it will upvote that question and show Paul and Jane that that is a question um, that lots of people would like to be asked. So have a good time. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our moderators for this afternoon, Jane and Paul Ayub. Paul is the executive on the executive committee of the Boston law firm of Nutter, McLennan and Fish, representing clients locally and nationally in commercial real estate and business matters. He also serves as the vice chair of the National Board of Governors of St. Jude Children's Research Hospital and as chair emeritus of the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors. More significantly, he is married to Jane Cronin Ayub, who much like that girl began her career as a single working woman in New York City, in Jane's case in investment banking for many years before moving to Boston to continue her career and earn a law degree at the same time. Jane and Paul will be celebrating their 29th wedding anniversary next month. They live in Boston and have a 26 year old daughter, Lizzie. Now, Jane and Paul, welcome. So, Welcome all of you. Um, so Marlo and Phil, we have people of different ages and generations, and so we thought we'd just take a minute to give you the fulsome introduction you deserve um, for all that you've accomplished. And I will introduce you, Marlo, and Jane will introduce Phil. So Marlo, of course, author, actress, activist, conceived, produced, and starred in That Girl back in 1966. Eight books, many of them bestsellers, including the one that inspired so many people for decades, Free to Be You and Me, which evolved into a Platinum album, an Emmy award-winning TV special, a theatrical production. For all you've done, you've received four Emmy awards, a Golden Globe, a Grammy, the George Foster Peabody Award. You're inducted into the Broadcasting Hall of Fame and in 2014, Barack Obama bestowed upon you the Presidential Medal of Freedom. But what connects our families, of course, is our joint life mission and passion for St. Jude. I think everyone knows that you're the National Outreach Director for St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, and your dad founded it um, in the 1950s, uh, founded ALSAC, which was a fundraising and awareness organization that then funded St. Jude. And what some people may not know is that my father had the honor of being called by your dad to fly out in 1957 to Chicago for that first meeting to talk about planning St. Jude. They wrote the bylaws together for the organization that is now St. Jude. And that became their life passion and now ours. And I have the privilege, as Alex said, of serving on, as vice chair of the board. So Marlo and Phil, welcome, and Jane. Thank you. Marlo and Phil, it is so nice to see you. As most of you know, Phil Donahue's contributions as a producer, journalist, and essentially a pioneer in media have been long lasting. The Donahue Show was the first talk show format that included audience participation. It had a 29 year run, 26 years in syndication. It was the longest continuous syndicated talk show in US television history. The show won 20 daytime Emmys, 10 for outstanding host and 10 for best talk show. Phil, you would be a breath of fresh air on television today. Because of Phil's country, yes. Because of Phil's contributions to television journalism, 
he was awarded the Academy of Television Arts and Sciences Hall of Fame. And like Marlo, Phil was the recipient of the George Foster Peabody Award. It's wonderful to see you both. Welcome. And let's get started. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So welcome. And um, uh, Marlo and Phil, why don't we start with just something about, well, first of all, we love the book and uh, you know, so many lessons learned in it. But question is, you've been married for 40 years. You've done lots of projects independently. What prompted you to do the book after 40 years and do it together? Well, we had decided never to work together because we're uh, both type A personalities and we, we figured we'd kill each other. But um, it was really fun and we learned a lot about each other doing it. And we did it because we'd been married 40 years and about to be married 40 years. And everybody always asked us, you know, what's the secret to your lasting marriage? And we always said, we don't know, we're not experts. We love each other, we like each other, we're not sure exactly why. So we thought if we talked to a lot of people that had long marriages, maybe we'd figure out what the secret sauce was. I guess that's pretty much it. Yeah, I think it is. <laughs> um, so your book, it's really, it was quite an accomplishment. And, it, you know, let's call it a labor of love. And the stories are amazing. The, the couples that you interviewed, their stories were honest, raw and emotional in some points, and, and really an interesting, diverse group of people. But the story that I was most fascinated by is your story. Uh -oh. um, I think many people have seen that video, that iconic video of the two of you meeting on, on your show, Phil. Take us back to that moment. I'd love to hear what was going on in your minds. Well, I, I, when I went to the green room before the program, I was excited because Marla was a, she was a two-part guest, really. She was gorgeous and uh, been in films and TV shows, known by everybody, and a feminist, you know, out front, first line feminist in all the, all the demonstrations. So she could not only draw a crowd because she was an actress and a good looking one. She was, when I walked in the green room, I thought, wow, this is a, I don't know if you have to be Catholic to, to know this, but uh, she was an impure thought. And you know, that, that, was, that was item one. But also she could talk, you know, in very serious tones about uh, women, um, politically how they're doing, where the, where the problems were, where the patronizing, uh, oh, honey, you're, you're doing fine kind of attitudes existed. And she, uh, you know, she put a little, a lot of glamour really into uh, the show, which was really important to me because the show was an hour and she's the only guest. <laughs> You know, and so I would have nightmares about asking a six minute question and the guest says, yes. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking for my notes. He said I was a hangover guest. Uh, oh, well, well I, I, go ahead. Del. You tell it. Well, that means, you know, she's a guest on those mornings when I was not ready to do a TV show. And so I could just clear my throat and she would keep the audience. <laughs> with some wonderful, wonderful commentary. <laughs> and Marlo, what, what was your impression of Phil? He walked in and I had not seen his show because uh, he, he wasn't in L.A. at the time. His show was not in L.A. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't really want to do it because it was an hour and it was 9 a.m. And my press agent, I was on a tour for a movie and my press agent said, you got to do this guy's the biggest thing in the Midwest. And I said, one hour at 9 a.m.? I mean, that's so early for an hour. And I'm, I'm not that interesting. What am I going to say for an hour? So she said, no, no, he, he's great. So I, you know, I, I, then he walked in. And, you know, the white hair, the killer blue eyes. It was like a shampoo commercial, you know. Everything went in slow motion. But then he said to me, he's putting on his jacket, and he says to me very casually, I'd like to talk about your mom. Is that okay? I thought, my mom? Nobody ever wanted to talk about my mother. 
It was always about my famous father and what, how that influenced my life. And uh, that really impressed me. Oh, wow. Okay, this is a guy who's uh, not superficial. And so we had a really good time. And we flirted and it was, you know, I mean, there I was talking about feminism and saying these really brilliant things like, oh, Phil, you're so funny, Phil. You know, it was like so embarrassing. But it was, uh, it was honest, <laughs> that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just say, if people haven't seen it, I, I watched it just getting ready for this again. It's it's one of the sweetest it's moments. Adorable. It's just so beautiful and romantic and pure at the same time. It's really a, it's a beautiful moment. Yeah, yeah. I, I I would say it's electric. Yeah. You, can, you yeah. can see the the static electricity in the air. It's wonderful. Yes. So great great story. And uh, you interviewed forty couples for your book. How did you choose the couples to interview? Well, we wanted them to be long marrieds, of course. Right. And we also wanted them to be of various professions. You know, so we had President Carter and Rosalind, and then John McEnroe, an athlete, Billy Crystal and uh, Ray Romano are comedians, and George Stephanopoulos and, and Al Roker are newscasters. Sting. And, and, right, Sting and LL Cool J and right. Elton John are, you know, obviously great music people. So we... Uh, you know, we wanted to see if, if that made a difference. You know, you, the, the, do professions make a difference? Uh, and also different religions, Christians and Jews and Muslims and Buddhists. Um, and we wanted uh, uh, also obviously different races. And we wanted same-sex marriage and opposite-sex marriage. And to get them all together and see, you know, what is, what's the secret sauce? What, what makes it work? Mm -hmm. What I liked about the book is it's not about sort of like it's not a how-to book. It's a what 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 does make it work. It's not Please. it's not like one thing or a few things. And so I'm curious as you I think you described this like being on double dates when you when you did these. Um, so uh, what were some of the common threads you saw um, among the forty couples that didn't were the what's that made it work? Or were there were there a few common threads? I want to take that. Yeah, I uh, I knew right away. Uh, when we started, there was always at least one member of the union who really wanted the marriage to work. They were invested in the relationship and way past all the, you know, the uh, cloud of lust and the <laughs> excitement of the wedding, <clears throat> uh, past all that. And you could tell that they were ready for whatever happened. And what we discovered is in every marriage, something happened. Yeah, big challenges, you know. Uh, uh, Chris Guest woke up one day and realized that his wife, Jamie Lee Curtis, was a drug addict. You mm -hmm. know, and Phil said to him, well, did you think I'm going to get out of here? He said, no. Nobody ran for the exit sign. Every one of them got through it. Jesse Jackson's, uh, you know, wandered outside of his marriage and had a baby outside of marriage. And I said to her, well, oh, wow, did you, did you consider throwing him out? And what, what did she say? No, he belongs to me. Yeah, he belongs to me. And, and she would say when people ask her how many children you have, she would say, well, I have five. The reverend has six. Yeah. He, she's, ca he calls him the reverend. She's, the reverend. she's a real firecracker. <laughs> and she said something interesting, too. She said, this marriage is a test of my character, which I thought was brilliant. You know, she, she wasn't going to throw it away. You know, uh, Kira Sedgwick said something I thought that was, you know, succinctly it. She said, there can be no plan B when you get married. And they had a real challenge. She and her husband, Kevin Bacon, lost all their money, 30 years of savings to Bernie Madoff. And Michael J. Uh, Fox and Tracy Pollan for, found out in the first three years of marriage wow. that he had this lifelong diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. There was every challenge you can imagine is in the book. We didn't pick them for their challenges, but in 40 couples, you're going to find every challenge there is. And what really we saw, as Phil said, they were invested in the marriage and none of them went for the escape route. They held hands, 
They walked through the fire and they got on the other side. Speaking of, uh, you know, you can't, you can't predict what's going to happen in a marriage. Uh, Lori Sullenberger, at home, normal day, the phone rings, and a voice says, uh, Mrs. Sullenberger, <laughs> your husband just saved the lives of over a hundred passengers. He landed his plane in the Hudson River. <laughs> well, my dear, <laughs> I mean, the, the, the roof fell in on their house. They had media on the front yard, they and their phone rang all day long and they lost a lot of friends <laughs> who didn't want to be involved in this media circus it very much affected their children uh, and they're very they're, they're lovely quiet people they did not know what to do with this sort of invasion because you know most people who become famous it takes years to become famous this was an overnight thing so it, that was another another challenge I don't know. Was that did I answer your question? I forgot the question. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I think it did. But I, I want one that I really love in terms of having a trial and tribulation is the story about Ray Romano and his mm -hmm. wife ha going to the hospital. Maybe you want to relate that one because I thought what I loved about it is so they were all so authentic. There, there was no veneer to these stories, and but mm -hmm. the Ray Romano one I thought was great. If you wanted to share that as well, but. well, it was uh, yes. Uh, they found out that she had breast cancer, and it was interesting. And thank God she's fine. Um, it was interesting to see it from the husband's point of view because mostly when women, you know, it's women who talk about breast cancer, of course, but to hear it from his point of view. And then his father had been quite ill. And as she was going into surgery, he found out that his father had died. And we just started crying. I mean, it was how awful. Your father's died, your wife's on the way in with breast cancer. And he said, at that moment, I thought, well, dad's gone to a place where he can watch over her. Yeah, that's and so dear. Oh, it just was really so, so dear to, to hear that. You know, a lot of people who've interviewed us have said, uh, who are in the press, have said, we never could have gotten these kinds of stories from people. You know, how, how did you get them? And I think it's because we didn't go out as reporters. And we didn't do it on the phone. We went to everybody's house. We flew all over the country. And I said, I'm not talking about our, didn't I say yes, you did. Uh, I'm not talking about our marriage. <laughs> and then when I got involved, um, you know, we thought they'd be 20 minutes, 25. <coughs> I would, uh, I would, when I started talking about our marriage, it seemed to blow the barn door open. Mm. And they, not, they all, it was like they couldn't wait to talk about their marriage. Right. And so we, we were really very lucky. We were blessed with people, couples who wanted this union. They wanted to hang on to it. You could tell the minute we started. And, you they, could went, see it. and they went to marriage counseling. Many of them went to marriage counseling. I, which I came to realize is that is a, that may be one of the greatest acts of love when the the partner one of the partners or both uh choose to go to marriage counseling actually you know make themselves wide open for the commentary and give the marriage counselor the information he or she must have to make this whole again and uh uh, Brian, uh, Brian Cranston is married to Rob Dearden, who's also an actress, and they have a terrific marriage. Um, he said that they went to marriage counseling, not for a referee, but for an interpreter, which is really a, a, an amazing thing. Because that's how people have arguments, is you, you misunderstand what the other person said, and you know you carry that around. And then sometimes we, we had arguments in the early part of our marriage, and I would carry around the fact that he said this thing and how could he have said it? And then finally, when we would talk it out, it isn't really what he said at all. Mm. I just heard it. And so that's a great way to use a marriage counselor as, a, as an interpreter. So what I loved about the book, all of these backstories that you didn't hear or see anywhere. Um, Trudy Schuyler, I mean, I was so um, interested in her story. They They sort of fell in love immediately as neighbors. I know. And she talked about her jealousy when she would she would date 
they were going out initially and, you know, women would throw their underwear at him. And um, she, she had to deal with all of that. Yeah. And Rob Reiner, um, his, his uh, date, Michelle was a heavy smoker, I guess. And he really had a problem with that. So she would sort of run out to the ladies room and sneak cigarettes. And so it, what, what was interesting to me was there are many couples that were, that seemed to be in sync right from the beginning. Uh-huh. And yet there were others like Mary Madeline and James Carville, for example, they, they were so different. Um, you know, I, I loved her story about their parents and um, her, she said, my parents came from a generation of uh, the one diva families. Uh-huh. But, but what she admitted was that it was really uh, difficult for her when there were discords in the marriage because her parents never fought. Right. So it's just really fun to see all of those stories that, as you had said, you, you wouldn't have seen or read anywhere else. They, they're really interesting. It isn't often. I mean, I've, I've known you for a long time. Uh, I, it isn't often that a husband and wife sit down with another husband and wife to talk about marriage. Right. You know, nobody right. does that. We've known the Alan Aldis for 30, 40 years. We've never discussed marriage together. So, and, the, and and to interview them for the book, of course, we did. And each interview lasted about three hours. In, in mm-hmm. some cases, we'd stay for dinner. I mean, we made new friends. Yeah. Uh, uh, but I think uh, uh, when you mentioned Carville, James Carville gave us the best advice. Was tell them that Carville's <laughs> one of the little nuggets of uh, keeping your marriage alive. Uh, Carville's suggestion is when you find yourself arguing about an unimportant issue, and that's what most arguments are about, you you mimic that. What, <laughs> you, you do you, it. You uh, do it. Well, you said you were. Well, I said you didn't mean. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, he said, kick that can down the road. <laughs> now, now, this, you know, this very shop worn common comment. Uh, came in very handy because it did put an end to a silly argument and it got the couple back on the track to important to talk about important important things and he said it that at the, behind every successful marriage is a whole whole batch of cans in this alley and when we got off the road we were we were having one of the- <laughs> one day about, well, no, no, you said you put it. No, you did your whatever, around and around and around. And after a moment, Phil said to me, oh, let's kick that can down the road. And we both <laughs> started laughing and it's become our new code. You know, sometimes we just say can and we stop. It's mm-hmm. it's, just a, it's a great new tool. That's, that's sort of the fun of talking to a lot of couples because we'd get back on the plane to go home and say, that's interesting the way they did that. You know, we'd, we sort of picked them up. That was interesting to do. You know what I loved about their, them is that I think they may have been the only one where they you, you interviewed everyone together, but in that one it didn't it didn't occur that way um, because I guess Mary preferred to do it almost but wasn't it by email if I remember correctly or she yeah, she didn't she didn't show up for the interview <laughs> she showed up he, they they came here because he Talk was about Mary Matt. yeah he was in New Orleans mm-hmm. and she was in D.C. and they were supposed to be here at four o'clock. And he showed up right on time with his LSU t-shirt and LSU hat. And we're waiting for her. And she couldn't make it. She couldn't get the plane from DC, but we should just call her on her cell. And he kind of smirked when he said, call her on the cell. We called her on the cell. She didn't answer. He said, you don't understand, Mary. She's not good with devices or machines. She's not good with time. Anyway, she didn't show up at all. And then we interviewed him and he was just fabulous. I just loved him. He could have stayed all night. I just loved talking to him. And then the next day uh, she called me and she said, just send me the questions and I'll do it by email. I really prefer that way. She said, and it's not good for us to be interviewed together because sometimes we argue. So I said, okay, which I would have enjoyed. (laughs) I I just thought that was so funny for, it's a book about marriage and they know that they would rather not do it at the same time, I just thought, the irony. There's an irony there that I. Yeah, I know. And they're the only couple that weren't together for the interview in person. Yeah. 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 So um, you must have learned something in, involved in your own way, and you've talked about forty 
relationships. So what are some of the things that you took away or is there your relationship um, from, from these? Were there other things that you learned? Kicking the can down the road was one, but it must have, everyone must have had a little morsel of something for you. I'm well, curious I what that was like. I think what Judy, Judy Vior said, which I thought was a great way of putting it, she said, you know, he would, no matter, no he matter, could never be. Is yeah, a, yeah, no matter, how, yeah, no matter how hard you try you next. to work it out, he is never going to be you and you are never going to be him. So you got to accept that as a given and then accommodate all the differences between you. And Phil and I are very different. I mean, I'm, I am a very impulsive kind of person. If, if there's a problem, I'm looking for a solution right this minute. Phil is, if there's a problem, he steps back, wants to think about it, and that. So we have annoyed each other for years because I <laughs> want him to move on something better and he has wanted me to step back. And what we learned actually from working on the book every day, because we've never worked together before and we certainly have never been together every day working on something, we both saw that there are times when acting immediately is better and there are times when it's better to lay back. And so that gave us a new uh, understanding and appreciation for the other way of doing things. I don't know that we would have become so compatible uh, on that issue had we not worked together every day. Mm, yeah, yeah, for sure. So the other thing that I found interesting, the, the number of lessons that couples got or didn't get from their parents um, right. did, did your parents influence you in any particular way as it relates to your relationship? What do you think? Well, you know, the Irish usually keep it to themselves. <laughs> and that was certainly true uh, with my parents. They loved each other, to be sure. But uh, lessons... Uh, I don't know. I think they would probably rather try to swim across a wide river than to offer <laughs> lessons to their kids. <laughs> but it's certainly true that uh, if my father patted my mother on the fanny, it was a moment where I was aware that he really liked her, in addition to the fact that he loved her deeply. They they were married forever. So uh, yeah, I guess it's it's like uh, you remember the song, "Little things mean a lot." Uh, Touch my hair when you pass my chair. Little things mean a lot. Mm -hmm. I was always impressed by the lyrics of that song, and when we got into this uh, long multi-year uh, 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 challenge of doing interviews with all these people, uh, I not only learned a lot about marriage and how to make it last, but I learned a lot about my wife. And I realized how much I didn't realize about her as I watched her interact with the couples and other things on her plate. She, she's a water bug. I mean, she can make a right turn like boom, and she can, you know, she can do the the computer and the 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 uh, cell phone, you know, and take notes all at one time <laughs> and and uh, interview people. I'm 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 kind of I feel guilty really that I didn't have as full an awareness of these this multi-talented person that I was lucky enough to be the husband of until we got into this thing about marriage. And when she says, you know, you're not likely to discuss marriage even with your close friends. I mean, it's kind of weird if you stop over for, <laughs> a, you know, for an evening with your close friends and sit down and say, well, how's your marriage going? I mean, <laughs> yeah. a, 
a, you know, a bit of an intrusion. The other thing, though, mm -hmm. that I learned from my parents that Phil did not learn from his parents is I learned how to fight. Mm -hmm. And Phil never saw his parents argue or fight. And my mother was Italian and my father Lebanese. They knew how to fight. They knew how to yell. They knew how to get it out. And mm -hmm. Phil never saw that. And when we first got together, uh, when we would have a disagreement and I would go at it, he, he would leave the room. <laughs> I, would, I would chase him around the house trying to get him to, be, to fight with me. He couldn't do it. And then now he, he, can, no. do, uh, he can do it now. No, yeah. He first, can do it now. <laughs> first thing I do when I wake up in the morning is put on boxing gloves. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> that's something you have to see as natural, that it's not the end of the world. I, Later, when we were together longer and we talked about it, he thought having a fight might mean that the whole thing would break apart. Mm -hmm. To me, having a fight was just getting it out. And that was something that Ron Howard said, too, that they had to go to marriage counseling for him to understand that, that if you have a fight and raise your voice, you won't, you won't rip the marriage. And that's yeah, the... Let that's it a, out. Yeah. Um, and by the way, I, I discovered that going to see a marriage counselor is a i think the greatest one of the greatest acts of love well that's because you don't like to talk about yourself well that's true uh, <laughs> I, I, you know guys or women and men who are interviewers they don't like being interviewed i'm very impressed that as this process has gone on phil is talking more because when we first were doing interviews my brother, Tony, would call me and say, you never let Phil talk. And I said, but he doesn't want to. What am I going to do? Uh, but you've gotten better now at it, I think. Well, yeah. <laughs> After interviewing 40 couples, um, but, it was, it was, a, it was a, yeah. a very profound learning experience yeah. for me and, and for Marlo as well. Well, a couple things. First, I've sat with Marlo in the boardroom at St. Jude. And I have seen her multitask with your <laughs> iPhone and your iPad and then not miss a beat in any conversation. So I well appreciate the multitasker that you're married to and how talented you are in that respect, in, in all respects, but that one in particular. Thank you. But, but I also want to tell you, Marlo, and you probably don't know this, but your dad gave us some marriage advice. And um, I had the privilege of meeting him twice. And the second time I met him, it was in very early February, 1991. And there was a big St. Jude event in Florida. And um, Paul and I had sort of hung back. Everyone was headed into dinner and your dad was there. And Paul introduced me to your father. And he sort of stopped for a second. He looked at us and he said, I'd like to leave you with this thought, which as it turned out was very prophetic. And he said, um, when you will have disagreements, you will have fights in your marriage. And he said, it's really important at the end of the day, no matter how you think of the other person, to lean across that bed, pucker up, and give the other person a big kiss. Uh, that's it's sweet. Really, really yeah. sweet. It's yeah. really sweet. Yeah. So, Bob Woodward. Yeah, they decided that they would They'd say, I love you. Everybody. Yeah, they would say, I love you to yeah. each other. Every night, every yeah. night, and yeah. you know, after a while, that becomes a pretty deep uh, influence on your relationship. Right. It's amazing. Amazing. I, I said to him when he told us that, I said, "Do you do that in order because there's been some unrest that you want to make whole again?" He said, "No, it's a way of saying we're okay. Everything." Mm -hmm. And we started doing that too. Uh, and it's, it is, it's nice. It's a way of saying everything's good in our nest. Right, yeah. right. Well, um, we're gonna take a question, some questions, but we have one from the next generation, our daughter, Lizzie. Hi, uh, someone, Marlo. Hi, thanks for letting me crash the party. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I have a question for you. That was quite an entrance. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I have a question for you coming from a, a slightly different angle. So I have some friends on here and myself included uh, that are not married yet and would love your advice. We would love your advice for uh, people who aren't married, single people in the dating game today. Um, what would you tell us? Well, I'll tell you one piece of advice that we got from John McEnroe's wife, Patty Smythe. 
she said, don't marry potential. She said, mm -hmm. so many women say, oh, I've met this guy and he's got such potential. And, and Patty said, forget potential. Marry the person <laughs> that you see. They're not going to become a different person. That's the person you're going to marry. And that's the person that he's going to continue to be. So I thought that was a really good piece of advice. Don't marry potential. Um, mm -hmm. And also, I, I think uh, President Carter said he thought the most important thing for a good marriage is to really give each other space, real space, to allow each person to grow and evolve and even become a little different in some ways, but to give them the space to grow and not insist that they stay in any particular way and, or if they want to change their work or if they want to change what they do in their lives, make space for that. Yeah, and popular uh, music and lyrics can work against this too. Baby, you're my everything. Well, nobody can be somebody's everything. And I think it's important to at least understand that. And also, what was it? Uh, uh, oh, jealousy. Jealousy drains you. Boy, that, that can, I know something about it. <laughs> I, I've been jealous of Marlo. I mean, you Well, know. tell them why though, that was. Well, uh, one one big example. <laughs> Marlo, Marlo, Marlo made a movie with Chris Christopherson, uh -huh. and it was, there was a love scene in it. <laughs> and I watched the love scene. Big mistake. <laughs> and the love scene seemed to go on for about four and a half years. <laughs> I thought it was never going to. So. Um, and he kept asking me, well, what did you think? I mean, well, what did it feel like to kiss him? I mean, I mean, that's acting, but still you must feel something. I mean, he just drove me crazy about it. And I said, well, there's about 900 people holding microphones and lights. And I said, even if you had an inkling of wanting to feel something, you couldn't feel something. I mean, there's just too much going on, but, yeah. but he got over that. Yeah, I think, <laughs> and I should tell us about the uh, jealousy. Which one, about Mark Consuelo? Yeah. Well, that's going to take us all other place. Well, you think so? Well, go uh, ahead. Uh, um, <laughs> Mark, yeah. We just negotiated this. Well, maybe I, maybe it's not a good idea. I thought it would fit a little bit. <laughs> go ahead. Mark and go is making, he's making a movie in Boston. He's married to Kelly Ripper. And Kelly's <laughs> at home. He calls her and he says, well, what did you do with your day or something what like that? What are you going to do tonight? What are you doing tonight? And she said, oh, I'm, I'm going to be cleaning toilets and sprucing up the house. And, and he thought that sounded a little fishy. So he jumps on a plane from uh -huh. Boston to New York without telling her. And he gets to the apartment. And he tells the doorman, uh, tell my wife I'm here. But No, no, say there's flowers coming up. Right. <laughs> and so uh, she's at the door as he gets to their floor. <clears throat> and he... He runs down the hallway. He didn't even, he just ran past he her. Ran, he runs right past She's standing there with a the Johnny mop in her hand. He runs right past her. Because he's looking for the tall, dark stranger hiding <laughs> behind the drapes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, and then uh, it's resolved. Uh, well, no, she just said, are you ever going to, are you ever going to trust me? I said, I'm going to clean the toilets. And that's what I was doing. And yeah. you were saying, well, that was the jealousy. He yeah. said uh, he said he got better after that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and by the way, really, I know something about jealousy. Uh, you know, people knock me over to get to Marlowe. So, and, so you know. Lizzie, that's not, but this isn't answering Lizzie's question. We've answered. Did we answer your question, Lizzie? Absolutely. Don't marry potential. Don't be jealous. And then there was a third. What was the third? Obey your parents. Don't clean toilets. Uh, and, and obey your parents. I thought, I thought, I thought that was in there too. And don't lie about cleaning the house. Yeah. Well, thank you. I'll let you guys continue. Thanks, <laughs> nice to see you. That's great. So uh, that's great. And I know that um, you, you interviewed some uh, couples where one, uh, there was an imbalance in notoriety. So one might have been the more um, well-known. And, and that came up a lot in, in, I think, a lot of the interviews. Um, one of the questions we had from our, our group in the chat room here is, uh, of all the ones that you interviewed, were there some that were your favorite interviews for, and for whatever reason that really, so that, that was great. Or is it like having 40 children when you love them all, but for different reasons? I, I think so. I mean, we, 
every one of them, they were so generous. They were so honest. Uh, as I said, the, the, the interviewers have said to us, how did you get them to say those things? They, they once, as Phil said, once he talked about our marriage, which he said he wouldn't do, uh, they opened up and it became a real, a real double date, a real conversation, one that we wanted to share. If somebody talked about jealousy, then the other one wanted to tell their jealousy story. If you talked about something your mom did, then they'd tell what their mom did. It was a, a real give and take conversation. I can't, I could never pick one that I thought was the best one. The one that I was the most excited about was meeting Elton John. Mm -hmm. I mean, on the way to meet Elton, honest to God, every song he ever sang was dancing in my head. I just love his music. And I think that's the only interview we did where I was actually starstruck. I thought, right. oh, wow, Elton John. And they were just charming. And perfect example of us being so different we get to Toronto, that's what he was performing, and his husband, David Furnish, was with him. We get there, we're all excited. The assistant calls and says, uh, you're only gonna have 30 minutes. I said, 30 minutes? We're used to three hours. Oh, we, I didn't know what to do, so I said, okay. So I immediately got out my pad and started making a, a list of questions, which we never brought questions to the interview. And we just let a conversation happen. So anyway, I make up 10 questions rapid fire questions that I can get answers to so that the end of 30 minutes will have something. While I'm doing this, he goes and turns on the TV set and watches a ball game. So I was really serious. I said, aren't you gonna help me with this? We're only gonna have 30 minutes. I, look, help me, are these the right questions? And he said, oh, trust me, they're not gonna throw us out after 30 minutes. <laughs> I was furious with him. Anyway, we get upstairs to their suite and he was right, we were there about 90 minutes. And so that's a difference in our personality. You know, I go right for the panic button. And he said, well, it turns on the ball game. Um, he was right. Probably after 29 years of interviewing people, you learn how to roll with the punches. Yeah. Um, that's right. And by the way, I was realizing that I, I, I know, I appreciate how long, um, I don't mean this in a long way, 29 years is the length of our marriage. So uh, I admire that you were able, uh, that you know, you did your show for 29 years. It's really it's a long time. Yes, Phil. Uh, we have um, we have a question. We're going to bring in Alex if you can hear us. Judy Habib has a question, and uh, Judy's obviously a great friend of yours, uh, Marlon. I love Judy Habib. Hi, Judy. So Hi, we're going to bring wait, we're going to bring them in uh, hopefully, um, and and because she'd like to ask a question as well. I just got an invite, so you'll just need to accept that. Okay. So why don't we? So I one of the favorites I had actually was the first one in your book was uh, Jimmy and Rosalind Carter mm -hmm. and how they met and how you described how she fell in love with his white uniform. I, I just thought that was so sweet. Picture. Yeah. Show them that picture. It's right at the and beginning of the book. They don't have the book there. Oh, they don't. No. Oh, maybe oh, yeah. not. But what's the? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What is the question? The first. No, it's, I, well, the, it's the, the house, first house. Your picture in the book. Okay. Yeah, oh, it's, it's so great. So why did this? How did you decide to, what pictures did you use? You know, how did you decide to use an early on picture of everybody? Because that, obviously that was a theme in the book. We, we thought it would be great to, because we're talking about marriage and, and a lot of, about the, how they met and weddings and all. So we thought, you know, the, the, the great insignia of that would be, you know, their wedding picture. And what was fun is we collected them all to see through the years you know, 73 years the Carters have been married. So interesting to see the way clothes change. I mean, Ray Romano and Anna Romano's picture is one of my favorites in the book. It's a real Italian wedding. I know I'm Italian. And all the weddings I ever went to in my mother's family, the long satin dress with the long train, and he's in this blue tuxedo. I just got, I just, it was fun. It was, it was a fun way of seeing who they were when they started, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and we also were impressed with how many people sort of felt as we did at first sight that something something electric, something chemical had happened. Billy Crystal was throwing a ball on the beach. He was like 18 years old. And he saw Janice walk by in a pink bikini. And that was it. He fell in love with her on the beach. They've got they've been married 50 years. They've got they have a great marriage. But it was but something it, you know, it was something beyond that pink bikini, but so many people met on the first date and just, just knew it. There was a lot of, 
that was, that kept repeating itself. It's amazing. Yeah. The number of it, it kind of confirms Malcolm Gladwell's book, Blink, how important that first impression is. Yeah. And uh, it was, it, we were surprised by the number of, uh, who, what are we looking at? Judy and Rich. Oh, hey, Judy and Rich. Hi, Hi. 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 Hi guys. Hi. How are you? This, this is a fun group. I know this group very well. This yeah. is like a little family reunion, and this has been such a fun conversation. Paul and Jane, fabulous. And Marlo and Phil, we love you so, so much. It's so great to see you. Ditto, 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 ditto. Here's my question. We had the joy and pleasure of uh, having of sharing our little hideaway down here on Manomet Beach with you both. Was it last summer or two summers two ago? Summer. And you know, we talked about code. And there was a little something that Phil said to you when he was sitting out on a perfect weather day. And he said, oh, honey, this is a, this is a PM or P, 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 P H M. Will you tell me? It's a PHM. You want to say what that yeah. means? Well, she's taught me this. <laughs> Perfectly happy moment. Yay. Yeah, it is. Yeah. You know, you, there's a moment that happens in life where you're looking at a sunset or you're having a great pasta or just sitting <clears> and talking and everything is working. Everything is peaceful. Everything is aligned. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, a hundred years ago, I said, wow, this is a really perfectly happy moment. And he said, yeah, it is. And after that, that became our sort of code when, as he said that day on, on the deck at your house, this is a PHM. That's when everything is aligned. We had another one too. On the boat. On the boat. Tell them about that. On the Mississippi Queen. Uh, they had an orchestra. Uh, what a what little you Dixieland call it? band. Yeah. And uh, dancing. And. I looked at the, I don't know, was it four or five yeah, yeah, people in right. the orchestra? And one of the uh, members of the orchestra was the clarinet player. And he was having more fun than I've ever <laughs> seen. I mean, it was, I don't know why it was, was so, I was so It impressed. was just blissful. Mm -hmm. And Phil nudged me and said, look at the clarinet player. And I said, I know, I'm watching him. And that mm -hmm. became another code. Yeah. And whenever we see people that are enjoying themselves, it could be a waitress, it could be a, a grandfather playing with his kid in the street, it could be anybody, we'll say to each other, that's a real clarinet player. Mm -hmm. And those little, you know, codes are sort of tucked into the cupboard of marriage and, and they belong just to the two of you. And I'm happy to no, share no. them with you. Yay! Now they belong to everyone. <laughs> I'm so glad to you, Judy. Uh, that's, that's Let amazing. me just say, I think this is a PHM having us all together. So <laughs> all right. Right. Great, to you, great to see you, Judy. Thank you. Good to see you. Love you. Bye-bye. 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 That was great. That was great to have them part of this. Yeah, isn't it? It's special. So good. So I'm looking at some of these comments, and a friend of mine from Florida, Laura Kaufman, um, mentioned we need these wonderful stories, especially during this pandemic. So not to end on that note, but I do want to talk to you a little bit about that in terms of how you've been faring with this strange world in which we find ourselves. Well, uh, I think we'll- Well, Marlo has made it uh, in some ways fun. For example, you know, I'm, I'm totally focused on I, I'm watching cable news all, all, all night day long all night. because it's where I used to work. And so I'm fascinated. You know, it's like being able to peek into the window where you, but I, you used to work. But I know? want him to watch a movie with me. So I'll watch the first hour of the news and I figure I've got it. Okay, I don't need to watch every other hour. They're all going to say the same thing. So mm -hmm. I want to watch a movie. And I, I've lined up movies that he may not have seen like Chinatown and, and, you know, Bonnie and Clyde or the great Mel Brooks comedies or Woody Allen comedies. And so well, to make it, to make it more uh, to likely lure, that to, I'll to lure him, to lure him. She makes popcorn. Now I figure the smell of popcorn is kind of like the dance of the seven veils. If I can <laughs> get him to smell the popcorn, 
and the butter and the salt. I might get him in to see the movie with me. So uh, doing? I'm stuffing it in my mouth. <laughs> but you know, uh, I it, I feel guilty to say this because there are people in this country that are suffering, and mm -hmm. we know we know people that are suffering with COVID. Um, so I, I I say this with great respect that this has been a a, a lovely time for us. We've never ever eaten three meals a day together, except if we're on a vacation. Um, you know, whoever gets up in the morning first has their breakfast, lunch. I'm always eating out of a paper bag in the back of an Uber going to a meeting. Dinner we do have together, but mm -hmm. because we've been alone, we have a housekeeper. But we during quarantine we didn't have a housekeeper, so we made our meals together. We ordered the groceries and decided what we wanted to have for the next couple of days, and then we had our every meal together. That's been like a, a gift, a, a, mm -hmm. a very lovely thing to to have three meals a day. So we've uh, we've had a, a good time. Yeah, and I think uh, we we share the same the same experience in being with Lizzie. And I mean, as horrible as the pandemic clearly is. Um, I think it's made us, like it has for everyone else, appreciate what we do have as opposed to, in, in addition to what we don't have, which is, you know, world health. Um, and the togetherness has been a real, it's, it's been a nice thing in, in that way, but uh, notwithstanding what's going on in the world generally. And it's interesting to find out what you really don't need in your life. You don't need to run around as much. You can do Zoom, you can do calls, you can, uh, you can spend more time together without all this running around. There are many things I think that we found that yeah. we, we can get rid of some of this fat. Yeah, we spent yeah. a lot of time uh, getting off the airplane. Right. I mean, yeah, that's we were on airplanes. So you much know, when so. we were putting this book together. Yeah. I can't even remember. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we have to be on. Yeah. Um, so um, it was great to see Judy. I did want you to know that. All of the St. Jude board members from our region are on today. So you know, I, I know you know them. I just want to you know, mention Terry and Bonnie and my brother, Joe and Krista and Camille and Charity and Chuck and Ann Hajar and Cheryl and Paul and uh, Ramsey and Lisa uh, Haney. So, so, so I just want to let you know you're with family as well. Thank you. At our wedding, Thank uh, you. my new father-in-law, Danny Thomas, raised his glass and said, I haven't lost a daughter. I've gained a fundraiser. So, but you know, somewhere in the reception, I realized that I had married a hospital. Um, so, 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 the final so question I'm getting, getting from you is, is out of all the people, all the people that you interviewed, how many people in family, family, family that, that had parents, parents whose marriages were just correlation? You're going in and out, Paul. We're not hearing you. Yeah, I think that Alex, Alex, is that you? Maybe, maybe. Oh, no, I think I'm only you're coming from. So, Alex, I think you're getting reverse on your end. I don't have any volume on. Okay. No. okay. You know, but this well, is consistent. Well. You know, in whatever, how, how long have been, was I on the air? 40, 29 years. 29 years. The problems have always been audio, not video. <laughs> so we're running into that right now with you. Will you try? What, so ask us the question. Uh, uh, a correlation, a correlation between, between parental, parental length, of, length marriage of marriage and, and the marriage of the people, of people you interviewed. Interview. So strong, strong parent, 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 did it oh, correlate? It, 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 no, it didn't seem to matter. Allie Wentworth, who's married to George Stephanopoulos, and they have a terrific marriage. Um, her parents divorced when she was two, and she always felt like an outsider in her mom's new marriage. Um, no, it, it didn't seem to. There were, and they have, a, as I say, a very good and strong marriage. A lot of people came from broken marriages. Um, I was very impressed with Ted Danson and Mary Steenburgen and just speaking about parenting and things, he had been, this was his third marriage and they'd been married about 30 years. And I said to him, wow, I mean, I was always afraid to get married at once. What optimism to tr keep trying. What made you think that this marriage would, would blast? And he said, well, for one thing, I stopped lying. 
And I was so taken aback by that honesty. I said, well, what did you lie about? He said, everything. He said, not just being unfaithful. He said, but lying about who I was. I wanted to be better than I was. I wanted to be the man on the, on the white horse. So I pretended that's who I was, but I never was showing my real self. I was too afraid to be vulnerable. But once I let go of that, I could have a real relationship. I could have a real marriage. Mm -hmm. I just thought that was so great. It's so true. It's, and that he had the honesty <clears throat> to say that. Yeah, that's yeah. wonderful. Yeah. I think we've, I think we've I think reached our hour, hour in more yeah. effort. Well, it so, was fast. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, for those who haven't heard her, we'll copy the will tell you how to get it. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Thank you. 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 This was a lovely party. Thank you for doing it for us. Thank you. 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 Thank you.